Good, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us today. It's great to see such uh, strong interest in this seminar uh, and in the business presentation element of, of the competition. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Elliot Brinkworth. I'm deputy chair of the uh, Formula Student Organising Committee. Uh, I've competed in Formula SAE and Formula Student in the past, in, about, uh, in the year 2000. Um, and one of my roles when I was competing was uh, delivering the business presentation. So I've been where you are uh, and, and you've, you've got my sympathies. Um, uh, but subsequently, uh, further to competing, I've also been a judge uh, and I moved up to being head business presentation judge for for three years. Um, so I, I'm sort of delighted to get re-engaged with this part of, of the competition. Um, each year at Formula Student, we have some really excellent business presentations and they're of the quality you might expect to see uh, in industry or, or in the, the work environment. It takes an awful lot of skill to get a compelling pitch covering all of the content that we're looking for in just 10 minutes. Uh, and it really is pleasing to see those high quality presentations. Um, but that standard isn't necessarily consistent across all entries. So we're really keen to support teams who you know, might aspire to, to being at that level of excellence, or even those that are you know, at that high performing level who just want to improve e even further. Um, and so why does this matter? Uh, well, I guess there's two factors to this. Firstly, within the context of formula student, uh, these are some relatively easy points for you to score in terms of your participation in the overall competition. Um, you can score equally well in this element of the competition, um, irrespective of your, your, your car uh, design and your car's performance. So uh, it doesn't matter if it's a, 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 a single cylinder space frame IC car or whether you've got a more exotic carbon tub, four wheel drive EV. The principles of, of getting across your, your business pitch and making a, a compelling business case around it uh, apply equally. In fact, you don't even need a car. So uniquely within the competition, we judge concept class and FS class together within, within the one uh, competition. Um, and we also, uh, yeah, we have, as well as the, the core Formula Student competition, we have the FSAI uh, sub-competition where the same principles uh, apply as well, albeit in a slightly different context. Secondly, and perhaps more important, is that presenting is a core skill for engineers, and it's one that you're going to need to use in your careers on a regular basis. And your Formula Student provides you with an opportunity to hone those skills in a low risk environment, hopefully learn from, uh, from, from what you've, uh, the feedback you've received and apply that in, in your future uh, careers. Um, now there's plenty of uh, resources to support you uh, in this and you can, you know, a quick Google search will provide some helpful uh, hints and tips. We've even got footage online of some previous presentation event finalists to give you an idea of, of the standard. Um, but most important is understanding the rules, as with any part of Formula Student, and that's for Formula Student and for FSAI. Uh, and for those of you who are in the, the, the Formula Student event, I hope that by now you've all seen the special condition that you'll need to weave into your, into your presentation. Um, but in terms of today's event, we thought it would be really helpful to give a, a practitioner's view of what makes a really good uh, or really outstanding business presentation. Uh, and to support us in that, I'm delighted we've got two speakers from McKinsey to offer their uh, reflections on how you make a compelling business case presentation. Uh, so we've got uh, Ivo Nikolov, who's the Solution Manager for People on Organizational Performance, and Christos Kapelos, uh, a Senior Associate for Product Development and Procurement. And as you'll hopefully have seen from their profiles, they're both former student alumni and they've had successful careers in the automotive and motorsport sectors. Uh, Ivo and Christos will give their presentation now. There'll be time for questions at the end. Um, if you do have questions, can I please ask that you put your questions into the chat uh, and I will do my best to get through as many of them possible uh, in the time available at the end. So I'd like to now hand over uh, to, to Ivo and Christos to, uh, to give their presentation. Thank you very much, guys. 
Thanks, Elliot. Thanks a lot for the uh, for the great introduction there. Christos, if you can move on to the next page, we'll start by introducing ourselves. So as, as, as Elliot um, uh, kindly introduced us already, we're, we're two um, McKinsey consultants, both of us with um, experience in formula student uh, in the past. So I'll start with myself. As, uh, as Elliot said, I'm a solution manager, um, but what that really means is I, I'm, a, I'm a consultant who uh, I focus on capability building for our clients. And my focus area is product development. Um, that's because um, my experience pre-McKinsey uh, was in product development uh, in the automotive and motorsports industries. So worked across a few different companies. I used to be a, a, an engine designer. Um, I, um, after Formula Student, actually, I, I thought I would go into uh, chassis design because that's what I focused on um, when developing our car back in 05 and 06. Um, but then I actually ended up getting a job at uh, Ricardo Consulting Engineers, uh, working on engine design, and that put me on a path then for the next 10 years, developing engines first for, for Ricardo's clients, um, including working on the um, the McLaren engine, the, the basis of which you know is still used in, in all of the McLaren road cars, their twin turbo V8, uh, before then moving on to um, Mercedes high performance powertrains uh, and working for a couple of years on the um, old V8 uh, naturally aspirated engines um, and then really devoting a large portion of my time when I was working at Mercedes to developing the V6s that that are still in the back of uh, you know Hamilton and um, uh, Hamilton's car and uh, gosh what's his other teammate now I'm so used to saying Bottas um, but anyway still being used to the to this day um, before then moving into McKinsey and uh, I worked um, for, for quite a few years uh, as a uh, operations consultant focusing on uh, helping our clients uh, either develop better products or um, uh, improving their um, product development processes. So that, that was my specialism and now I help with product development capabilities. And, um, and I'll hand on to Christos to introduce himself as well. Sure, thanks a lot, Ivo. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. I'm super excited to be here. And I'm really looking forward to a hopefully very insightful session for you all. Um, so a few words for me. Um, I'm a consultant. I'm, I'm based out of Munich office, um, but I come originally from Athens, Greece. This is where I studied. Uh, I studied mechanical engineering. <clears throat> and like Ivo, um, I was mostly interested in the aerodynamics part, and um, this is how I got involved first um, through the, the team that we had back then. And uh, after a few years, uh, I also had the opportunity to be as a judge, which was a different experience, but uh, I think equally rewarding and uh, exciting. Um, so before joining McKinsey, I spent uh, around five years in the automotive and motorsport industry. As I said, I did a lot of um, aerodynamics and specifically simulations so CFD for all of you that uh, you know the field and um, yeah after after these years uh, I, I did the switch uh, at McKinsey and I'm, I'm basically now uh, focusing on product development um, and procurement as well so I'm mostly working on projects uh, in many different industries of course automotive is one of these and I'm supporting our clients into solving let's say the, their toughest uh, problems um, in this field and I think to, uh, I'd just like to mention these two aha moments because um, I guess all of you are engineers. Uh, I was also an engineer. I still feel I am. Um, and one thing when, when I switched to, to consultant, um, I think this problem solving skills that we get as engineers is, is very strong. And we can see this because in the end, consulting is basically problem solving. So um, first thing I, I, got, I got really, um, yeah, let's say impressed that basically as engineers, we are one of the best problem solvers out there. So, so it's great. Um, and secondly, I thought that I would never talk about CFD again uh, or computational fluid dynamics or aerodynamics, but in the end, there are always problems in all sorts of, um, um, let's say, of, of uh, industries and, and areas. So um, there is always, uh, let's say, a need for many different specialties. Uh, so these two were, let's say, aha moments when I switched from, from engineer to consultant. Um, yeah, and I think with this, 
Um, I would suggest to, to see, first of all, what uh, what we have for today. So, Ivo, if you want, you can walk us through. Yeah. So, um, as Crystal started discussing, I mean, we, we both have backgrounds in engineering and we've transitioned into, into consulting. Um, we're in positions uh, in consulting at McKinsey where we continue to use um, a lot of the fundamental um, engineering know-how uh, that, that we've developed during our time in industry. But the, um, the, the consulting role puts us in a position where um, we have to work with our clients, we have to work internally with our colleagues um, and really um, learn to communicate uh, complicated concepts uh, in, a, in a clear and effective way. Particularly when working with our clients, this is, this is a core skill and it's something that um, that took a, a period of transition for me uh, to to really learn this skill, and it's something that I'm excited to um, to share with you guys today, uh, and to hopefully put you one step closer to um, uh, to being able to deliver a really fantastic uh, 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 business plan presentation um, at the event in in Silverstone. So. We'll go through a, a few points today. Uh, why is the business plan presentation an opportunity that you really need to embrace uh, uh, and put a lot of your uh, time and effort behind? Then uh, given the constraints that you're operating under, how do you uh, achieve clarity and impact in that presentation uh, and in general with any uh, communication to, uh, to, to others? Um, we're gonna share some tools about uh, translating ideas, concepts, data, uh, and putting it onto paper in a clear way, in a way that really uh, helps to pass on the messages that you want to pass on. And then some tips for uh, delivering your presentation uh, effectively on the day. Uh, because in the end, the, the written word, your presentation document, which you will probably spend a lot of time and effort putting together, is, is only the the canvas that then you have to work on uh, on the day uh, and really nail the final presentation. And then, of course, we'll have some time for your for your questions at the end. Um, uh, there's a there's a chat function um, that you can uh, uh, use in order to uh, to communicate your questions to us. All right, so let's get going. A little bit of an intro, building on um, Elliot's uh, words at the start. Um, you hopefully will be familiar with the rules that outline the requirements for the business plan presentation. Uh, and we have a, a couple of excerpts here from the rules that really talk about what the objective is and also some of the constraints that you're operating under. So firstly, what's your objective? Well, it's to um, uh, help evaluate the team's ability to develop and deliver a comprehensive business model. So you are going to be talking about why your vehicle and the business model and a business idea that is around your vehicle and your design um, could become a rewarding business opportunity. That's really the, that's the core message that you have to deliver in the presentation. Um, you'll be competing against class one cars and also class two concept cars. Um, and you'll be doing this in the form of a, a role play. So you represent your fictional company, your employees, owners of the company, and your audience are potential investors or potential partners that can invest money in, and, and turn this uh, this fledgling business into into a reality. So, um, as Elliot said, um, you know it's it's unique in that the actual quality of the actual of the car, the performance of the car on track, um, is not relevant to the business plan presentation judging. Um, and, and Elliot also mentioned the special condition. Um, so this year, it's it's about the uh, carbon impact of the vehicle, and that's something that you have to put in place. So these are all kind of hygiene factors uh, and setting the scene for what the presentation is going to be about. In terms of the format, um, I mean, let's start with the, the most pressing thing. You, you have 10 minutes, and anything shorter than 9 minutes or longer than 11 minutes uh, will be penalized. If you're overrunning, you'll uh, be rapidly asked to conclude the presentation. And obviously, that's not great because there'll be key information that's missing. So you have a very narrow window that you have to aim for of 10 minutes. Um, you also have limitations on the number of uh, people um, 
that will be presenting uh, practical limitations and you'll have um, uh, the opportunity to um, be asked questions at the end for which you have to prepare. So those are the, those are the sort of uh, main constraints that you're operating under. What does that actually mean for you? You move to the next page. You can treat this almost as a standalone competition uh, within, within FS UK. Um, you have to approach it as an elevator pitch so you have to be very concise and well-structured and have a clear message. Uh, trying to put too much detail, uh, will uh, you will run out of time uh, or lose your audience. And of course, you have to put yourselves in the shoes of your fictional target audience of investors and really think carefully, what is it that they are gonna want to know uh, and understand about your proposal and make sure that those key questions are answered. It's not an easy task. And so my, my advice at the very start would be don't underestimate the value of the points on offer, nor the challenge of doing this well. And think about how you can really uh, shape your team so that you can deliver this, uh, this presentation effectively. Okay, so we'll move on a little bit and, and start thinking about what are, the, what are the key elements that are gonna drive to a, a clear presentation. We'll start with, with a couple of different messages. So take a listen to this. Joanna called. She said that she can't make it to the meeting on Tuesday at 3 p.m. Any other time this week would be better. Monica said she doesn't mind moving the meeting either, maybe to Wednesday or Thursday, but not before 10.30 a.m. And Stephanie said Claudia won't be back from the U.S. until late Wednesday evening. The conference room is already booked for tomorrow, but it's available on Thursday from 11 a.m. What do you think? Christos, what do you think? I have to be honest, I have no idea. I think we heard this message uh, quite some times, but I still, uh, it's hard to understand what was the actual point of, uh, of this message. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of data, a lot of information, um, and no real message, no real way to unpick that and figure out what, what is actually the point of what's being said. Let's have a look at an alternative way of, of making that statement. Um, so we could just say, let's reschedule to Tuesday meeting, but it's, let's reschedule the Tuesday meeting to Thursday at 11. That's a time that's better for both Joanna and Monica and Claudio would also be able to participate. In terms of the person receiving that message, that's all of the information that they need. They just need to know it's gotta be at Thursday 11. The person um, delivering the message has clearly thought about it, has found a solution, prioritized what information needs to be um, given, structured the message, and also synthesized it. Said, "Okay, what's what? The, what's the so what to all of the information that I'm that I'm passing across?" And we today want to go through a few of those points. So. We want to talk to you about prioritizing what what is the most relevant information that you need to get across uh, in uh, in your presentation. Um, structuring how do you structure that information, and how do you create a story out of that information so that your audience can follow your argumentation logically um, and, and understand your messages. And then how do you synthesize? How do you go from just information and facts to information facts that lead to a message and influencing people towards taking some kind of action or coming towards some kind of conclusion. Right. So, so I think we can start with the prioritization. And I mean, in the beginning, I also had a lot of problem, right? Because you, you, you had me working on this, uh, on this presentation or in general on, on your on your teams for so long and you have so many details right so you have this tendency to to present all of the details that you want in the most let's say compact and efficient way 
but however, you still need to prioritize. And there is a, a method that uh, it's been out there for a long time. Uh, it's the 80-20 rule. Uh, I think it's a favorite saying by, by consultants, um, which basically says the following, that if you focus only on 20% of the input, so this might be data, details, uh, but I don't know, some it can be some, some other thing as well. So if you focus on 20%, you can still get 80% of the final output. Now, if we take this analog to your presentation, what we basically say that by presenting 20% of the most important details you have, you can still have 80% of the totality, let's say, of the story that you want to convey. And then, of course, you can then decide which kind of information you still need to add on top so that you reach, a, let's say, the totality of the story to 90% or 95 or even 100%. So basically, by focusing on the very, very key points and by implementing this top-down communication that we also uh, typically use and we will discuss in a bit, uh, you can have a very clear and structured message. And then you can still have at least 80% uh, of your message uh, coming through the audience. Now, the keys to success here is, first of all, to identify these key messages. So it's really important that you see all the details you have and really understand which of these are the important ones and they, they let's say they, they must have in your presentation a way to do this is by putting yourself in the audience and see what does my audience want to hear you're not there of course you're there to present yourself and your work but in the end it's it's the audience that that kind of um let's say, uh, says what they want to hear or, or sets the goal for this presentation. So think about your audience and use this as a prioritization tool to select the key messages. And finally, be clear and be simple. The more, the simpler you are, the better. And I think a, a good test to do this, and we'll discuss again uh, in, in a later stage of this presentation, is to basically present your idea to somebody that has nothing to do with your work. So. They're listening to Formula Student for the first time or to your, your team or, or whatever you want to present and then see how they react. Because that's a good test to see how simply you really present your, your thoughts. And in many cases, you will see that they, they don't understand anything. So you need to kind of reiterate and try to simplify a lot your message. So it's not trivial to do this. However, it is possible. And also a good way to do this is to also uh, have structure. And for structure, we come to the next point, which is the overall, let's say, top-down communication. Let us take a step back first um, and discuss a little bit about these two ways that you can communicate a message. Both of these are very good. Each of these is suited for different, let's say, purposes. What you have on the left is the so-called argument structure or deductive reasoning, or what we say bottom up. What you see on the right of the screen is the grouping structure, inductive reasoning, or top down. Now, the left is something that you might be super familiar with. I, it was also the way I used to communicate everything uh, in my life until I uh, actually started thinking more about top down. Uh, it's, it's how like academia works uh, in 80 or 90% of the cases. So you basically have a, a, a initial statement then you add your further arguments and then you lead up to the final conclusion or let's say governing thought. For example, in a scientific paper, um, or I don't know, if you if you do some work on your master thesis or, or bachelor thesis with your professor, you start with uh, saying the, let's say, initial situation, what has already been researched on this topic, then you move on to your own kind of assumptions, I don't know, experimental or, experimental or numerical setup, um, then you move on to the actual design of experiments, you say the results, and then after all this journey, you come up to the conclusion and say what you finally learned from this. Now, a very big advantage of this method is that uh, you can basically really connect to a very critical audience that is there to focus on your reasoning. And that's exactly why we see this so commonly in the academia. However, as you see, um, you go through a very long train of thought 
and there is of course the the danger that um that you will lose the audience because they're still waiting they're going through all your points and and all your ideas but they're still missing the so what which will come only only at the very end and that's why we have the top-down communication where you basically start from your governing thought so you hit them in the very beginning with your key message the so what what you want them to learn from you and then you explain how you come up to this this is very effective for action oriented audience uh, audiences it has some major points that you can easily kind of remember and, and walk through and if someone someone kind of disagrees with one of these reasonings it's still easy to kind of uh, let's say discuss and, and persuade them and if they don't completely destroy your whole argument however um, it can be considered a little bit more direct or more forceful. Now, what we typically recommend is that for business presentations, you, you have to be more top down. So you have to start from your key message and then lead uh, the, uh, the audience through your reasoning and how you reach this uh, conclusion. And the way to do this uh, is by basically using the pyramid principle. And as simple as you might expect, the, the principle, uh, the pyramid principle has on the very top the uh, governing thought. So this is, let's say, the key message. And then you have some other layers or levels which follow, uh, which are related to, let's say, the, the bucket that is above. For instance, you have the governing thought, then you have the key line arguments, and at the very bottom, the base are the supporting data. And this is exactly how you communicate this from the top, from the governing thought, to the bottom to supporting to the supporting data um, and three key let's say um, elements in this technique is first of all to uh, the synthesizing a reasoning so basically at any level um, so if you have you're here in the governing thought this is basically the synthesis of all points that you have uh, in the level below so the governing thought is a synthesis of all the key line elements uh, then the second part is the grouping meaning that for each group that you might have uh, they should be let's say related to the same key idea and the final is the ordering where you basically uh, it basically says that the ideas in each group must also uh, be logically ordered so this is how you basically use the pyramid principle to structure your ideas and to be able to communicate them in a top-down way now how, how do we build this it's super easy, at least at glance, <laughs> at the first uh, sight. You basically ask questions uh, to yourself. So the, the first basic question that you ask yourself is, um, what is the point of my presentation? What is the key message? And the answer to this question will be your governing thought. And after you have this key message, then you start asking other questions like why, how, in what way? And the answers to this will essentially help you build the low, the level below, which are the, is the key line. And then again, for each of these buckets, you ask again, hi, uh, why, how, in what way? And then again, for each bucket, you will end up with more, uh, let's say, ideas. For example, the governing thought could be that uh, you have built the best uh, racing car. A question would be why. Why is because you're passionate. Uh, in, in your work in, in racing, in motor racing, how could be, you can say we designed it and we manufactured this. So you have one of these light blue buckets would be uh, because you're passionate, the other would be uh, because you manufactured this and the other would be because you designed it. And then you can ask again, how did we design it? And then you have your supporting data below. So with this way, you can basically logically start from the governing thought and then setting these questions, you come up with the, let's say, the, the uh, key line or the supporting data that you have below. Now, a very important point is that um, when you're doing this, and essentially when you're designing this for your own presentation, just forget PowerPoint or any other slide uh, making tool you have. Start with a piece of paper and just write down everything so that you, you kind of um, put aside the whole design aspect of this. We will talk about the design in, in a few minutes, um, but when you start with your overall storylining, just start with a piece of paper. Prepare your storyline story as we discussed. So you start with these basic governing thoughts or let's say arguments, like you would have in an executive summary. And then for each of these, try to think of 
one or two kind of key messages that would support this particular argument. And you can think of these one or two additional, let's say, um, supportive arguments as additional slides or pages you might have in your deck. So essentially, when you do this, you will end up with a dummy deck or a ghost deck, as we might call it, where you have a very structured and very top-down storyline, starting from your key messages. And for each of these, you will have the corresponding, let's say, supporting uh, ideas on a page. And how this would look like, as discussed on the very left, you, you're starting with a pyramid structure, you have your governing thought, then you put it down on a paper, it's just a dash dot simple, let's say, uh, writing here, as you see, so the key um, action or reason, and then sub actions that support this um, for, for each of these. And then for each of these lines you might have, you can afterwards start building up a page and then uh, you have your draft document, and then it's really simpler as it sounds. The only thing you have to do is to just bring the fact, bring the data, bring the imagery that you need to really create this, um, create this slide, and and essentially finish up with your presentation. Maybe let's put it into a practical example, uh, Christos. Mm -hmm. If in this case your overall message, uh, and I'm assuming your overall message is gonna be, we believe we have a fantastic product um, that, uh, that you should invest in. That, that, could be, that could be the governing thought. We have a very investable business plan. Um, then what could be the, uh, the, 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 the subline reasonings for that? One maybe could be we've explored the market and we've found a uh, niche that we're fitting into where we believe we have a strong customer base and no direct rivals. And then you present one page, which shows that, that argumentation. Number two could be, you know, we, we have a design which is very cost effective. So we believe that with our sales projections, we're going to be able to make a fantastic, uh, you know, a really sustainable profit on our product. You have one set of evidence uh, to, to show that and then so on and so forth. That's great. <clears throat> Perfect. So once you have nailed the, the structure, then the final part is the synthesis. And here, I think it's just important to differentiate between these two similar words, synthesis and summary, which however are, are, are very, very different. Summary is basically when you look into, into all of your data and facts, and then you just, um, let's say, repeat them in maybe a more orderly manner uh, or a more prioritized manner. However, synthesis is, is a step further. So you look into the facts and data, and then you basically extract the key message or the insights out of this. So it's very important in your presentations to focus more on synthesis than on summary, because summary, anybody can walk through the data and just find the, more, the most important ones and just repeat them. But what your talent and knowledge and experience is, is basically they, um, let's say it can be used to really extract the insights and explain to the audience, what is this so what? What do we learn from this uh, fact and data? To bring it back to the example of the, of the phone call scheduling or the meeting scheduling, we could have summarized by saying, you know, Joanna can't make it on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. The other person cannot make it on this day. The synthesis is to say the time for this is Thursday at 11, let's do it then. You know, and that's a super simple example, but that's kind of the um, what we're aiming at. We're aiming to say here is a lot of data and here is what we believe is the conclusion of that data and the, the corresponding action that you need to take um, or, or conclusion that you need to make based on this data. That, that is the synthesis element. Great. <clears throat> And I think with this point, uh, we come to the next uh, part of or section of our presentation, which is mostly once you have all these ideas and once you have the, let's say the structure and the synthesis and everything, then how do you translate all this uh, onto paper? Thanks, Christos. Let's uh, move on one more page. So um, uh, the, the, the structure is, is incredibly important, but in the end, um, for each one of that, those, um, those bits of supporting evidence, 
that leads to your to your overall conclusion and governing thought of your of your presentation and the objective of your presentation you're going to have to have uh, a page uh, one ppt slide uh, if assuming that you're choosing a powerpoint as, as your delivery means so there are a few key concepts or golden rules uh, that we tend to try and follow <clears throat> in order to make our presentations legible um, memorable um, and most of all um, easy for people to follow um, the challenge that people have is that they will be wanting to listen to what you're saying they will also be reading the page so if we can um, a set up the messages that you want to deliver verbally in the best possible way with the page and make that page clear then they can scan that content and listen to you uh, and both of those things are very important so let's go through a few of these golden rules number one have a single message per page uh, and try and use the title of the page to convey that message in, in as concise a way as possible so Let's say you have a table of data. You could name the, the, the chart results and have your results page. Or you could have the results, highlight some of the um, patterns that you're spotting, and actually say, our results point to conclusions A, B, and C. Have that as the title. People immediately, when they're looking at the data, they start to see what it is uh, the, the, that you're pointing them towards. And you can e even go further and have a so what. So actually take the data, synthesize it, and have a message to say, we have found pattern that pattern in, in, our, uh, in our results. Number two is try and have simple visual layouts. We'll go a little bit into that on, on the next page. Presenting information in a visual way is, uh, is super helpful, specifically data. Um, we want to also limit the amount of data. So if you have um, uh, you know, a, a, a big spreadsheet that's projecting your sales figures, you want to try and find a way to present that in as easy a way to assimilate as possible. And back to the simple layout, uh, you know, things like not overwhelming people with visual stimulation, having lots of different fonts, lots of different font sizes, etc., <clears throat> is is a good way to keep things simple. So, maximum two fonts per page, maximum two font sizes per page. It helps to um, keep things simple, make it easy to read. Number three, clarity of content. Um, so labeling and defining content appropriately. If you have a data table, name that data table so people understand what it is. Use highlighting to focus on key areas for attention. For example, on this page, you know, you'll see that some words are boldened. That's one way to highlight, one way to show what is the most important element of a particular statement. Um, and, um, uh, and provide all these sources and footnotes so that you know where your data is coming from. Then the final one, number four, um, using effective style. We're talking about writing style, trying to be as concise as possible, use the fewest possible words. Um, this is something that as a consultant, uh, especially as a junior consultant, you hear quite often uh, being asked to de-word things, to say things in as, as, in as concise as possible a way. Um, using uh, parallel statements, if you have a list of bullet points, for example, making sure that they are all um, written in the same in the same way, uh, parallel on in terms of the level that they're at, um, it, level in terms of the the, the 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 messages that they're putting across, and you know, finally, <clears throat> check for typos. Make sure that you. Uh, you're, you're, you have that base level of professionalism and the hygiene factor that everything is grammatically correct and, uh, and well presented uh, without uh, simple errors, because those things tend to do away from the you know, experience of the, of the audience. Okay, so let's, let's look a little bit also at presenting data, because especially for a business plan, uh, which is what you're presenting, you will have you know, data to back up your argumentation. 
and you need to choose the best possible way to present that data. Um, we've highlighted uh, four different uh, data presentation methods here on the page, each of which have pros and cons, most effective uses, and also things that you need to watch out for. So we'll go through them in order. Scatter plots, <clears throat> fantastic for showing uh, relationships or correlations uh, between different um, uh, between different uh, parameters, um, but sometimes difficult to understand um, or difficult to see that pattern. Um, so it's uh, really important to use additional visual aids such as highlighting uh, or different colors, um, supporting lines such as an average or, or other relation or, or, or trend lines, for example, in order to show the patterns that you're trying to, to highlight. Stacked bar charts are another one that we use very often. Um, let's say uh, development of uh, margin or cost of a product through its lifetime, um, often used with a bar chart because it clearly shows the different categories within uh, within a one, uh, one number. If there's something that you're specifically trying to compare, for example, development of cost in, with time, then always have that category at the bottom uh, so that you can clearly see how the relationship is changing with any other parameter. Um, line graphs are really good for comparing um, different series to their peers. Um, uh, and it's always important to highlight very, very clearly the, the one line that you're most interested in showing, blurring everything in the background, uh, at, and actually putting a, a, a so what in there to, to explain really what it is that you're trying to show. And the final one, uh, waterfall graphs, again, a really powerful data visualization tool that shows how things uh, build up. Uh, we typically uh, use it a lot for cost. We also use it a lot for, um, let's say, carbon contribution of a product <clears throat> to say within the different categories of a product, the chassis, the engine, um, suspension, emissions control whatsoever, how does the cost add up to the final cost of the product, or how does the carbon contribution from manufacturing and logistics, et cetera, show up? So you, you can use all of these tools to put a lot of data on a page in a really clear way and in a way that's very easy to talk through when you actually end up presenting this in person. And I think Waterfall is, a, as you said, is a very powerful graph. Uh, so please give it a go. I think it's not so much used, at least in university years, for some reasons. But uh, give it a go, and you'll see uh, it's, it's a very nice graph to, to use for for cost split or things like this. Great. Um, so now we have done the the structure of the of the, uh, the presentation. We have managed to let's say visually. Uh, put them nicely on the page. And the question is, how do we deliver the, the presentation? Um, <clears throat> first of all, I'm not sure if you have to wear a suit. Uh, I don't remember, to be honest, uh, but be dressed uh, sharp. I mean, maybe not a suit, but at least uh, wear your good clothes. <laughs> um, but first of all, before you start your presentation, the I guess you will have multiple presenters, right? So define your roles. Uh, it's, it's very important that everybody's aligned beforehand and you know who has to present what in this way you will avoid this awkward i don't know 20 seconds where nobody speaks and uh, everybody looks at each other secondly write a script maybe on, on what you want to say but also be careful uh and don't don't learn it by heart because then it will sound very like fake or, or like it will be a robotic delivery what i usually do is uh, for for each of my of the pages that i have to present I have this dot dash of the key messages and the important things that I need to cover. And when I practice, I do kind of work my, my sentences and the words. But when I see that I tend to repeat a lot myself time after time, then I stop because it means that I can I know what I have to say. So it just left let a little bit of impro in the in the presentation so that it sounds a lot more natural and human. Um, number three, practice a lot. Uh, as we said, practice on your own, practice with, with your with your teammates, uh, practice with other people that have no idea about the formula student. It's important to, to play with your presentation across different audiences. And then even more important, get collect in, uh, feedback 
and then try to incorporate it into the document uh, and, and your delivery. So once you have this, you're prepared, then the question is, uh, what do you do now during the presentation? The intro of the presentation, so the introduction, is one of the most important parts. It's a, let's say, the key section in your presentation that you need to win your audience. Think about a, a concert of a rock or pop band. In the beginning, they start with one of the strongest songs, right? So they don't start with a, I don't know, a mellow ballad. They start with, let's say, the, the hardest, most dancing song ever. The reason for this is because they need to get the attention of people. So it's similar in a business presentation. Um, and a way to do this is to focus on, on four things. First of all, state your purpose. State what is the reason for your presentation and what is its goal. Secondly, say what the audience is going to gain out of this. So why should they stay there for 10 minutes and listen to you? Don't forget this, this is very important. Number three, go through the key points that you want to cover in your presentation. And number four, go through the process on how you're going to present this. I think especially nowadays where we're being distracted super easily by our phone, emails, whatever, it's, it's very important to, to do such an introduction because then all of the audience are aware of, of how your presentation is going to uh, kind of evolve. And then they can easily be or being oriented in case they, they get lost or they are being distracted. So doing such a strong introduction is very important and it also will help you with your overall confidence and physical appearance. And now coming to this topic, um, there are people who are super confident. There are people who have, have a huge stage fright. I think everybody can, can do presentations and it's important, first of all, to kind of turn off your internal critics. So feel confident and, and, and feel that you have worked so much for this and it's your time to shine. So just go for it and, and, and don't be scared. Nobody is judging. You're there to really do your best. Uh, so bring this enthusiasm and also smile. Huh? It's, it's also very, very important. And the secondly, be on time. <laughs> um, I think it shouldn't be there, but there are a lot of people who, who are late. Uh, of course, this can be also on, on uh, yeah, there might always be reasons to be late. But yeah, please try to be on time. In case you're late, also apologize, which is another thing that people forget uh, sometimes when they're late. So just apologize, maybe explain why you're late and go for it. Uh, but one more important thing is if you're earlier, you can also get more familiar with the space. Uh, so with the stage or with the room that you are presenting. And this is also important because you, you also start getting this confidence, right? So you can walk a little bit to see how, how it feels. And then when you start, it's not that you're just being dropped in a, in a random foreign, like alien place. You know already the, the, the space and then you just go for it. Start confidently. Um, you can either uh, crack a joke. It depends on the presentation you have, um, but always smile. Um, specifically about the joke, uh, what I've noticed is that usually when I when we have a joke before starting the presentation, we all laugh, right? And then it kind of takes away this, let's say, initial stress that you might have. So maybe cracking jokes before starting the presentation is also a good advice. Um, and then more about the, um, the, the posture and the voice. First of all, try to uh, vary it a little bit, the, the loudness of your uh, and the tone of your voice so that you don't come out as being boring. And secondly, so that you can use this as a tool to kind of emphasize the important things that you need to, uh, to highlight and you need to uh, convey to your audience. And in terms of posture, I, I hope it will not be uh, virtual. I hope you will be there. So always stand with your shoulders back and be open and use also your, your hands uh, to do some hand gestures or move around a little bit. You don't have to run from one point to the other in the stage, but move a little bit because this way you can also channel a little bit your stress uh, to a movement, which is, which is something that is being perceived quite naturally from the audience. So try to be kind of open and, and um, and of course, smile and then just, I think, uh, with this way, you will always show confidence and that you're also enjoying the presentation. If you, the presenter, don't enjoy the, pre the presentation, then the audience will not as well. So, uh, sorry, Ivo. Christos, maybe two points I want to make. One on the previous page, just to anchor and build on something that you said. We can move back one. Oh, there we go. So, <clears throat> one thing to say about the introduction. This... The payoff and the summary preview are your opportunity to already start anchoring what is your govern, governing thought. So 
when you talk about the payoff, you can also start talking about what is it that you want your audience to, to think um, at the end, at the end of the pitch um, and state that from the beginning in, in the introduction. Today, we're going to tell you about why our business plan is bulletproof. I'm not saying to take those specific words, but think of it in that way. And then the summary preview, one thing to point, you want to summarize what the content of the presentation is, but it's important to do that without going into detail on any of the points. You really want to have it as just an anchor, something that's in the back of the audience's mind to say, okay, here are the three main points that we're going to go through in the presentation and do it clearly, but quickly and, and not really elaborating too much. So the presenter's role is to frame what the overall discussion is going to be throughout the next nine minutes, let's say. Um, uh, so it, it's, a, it's a really uh, important role. And then one final point on, on the next page, Christos, about the um, varying of tone of voice, uh, moving, you know, being able to use the space and move around. You have the advantage of being able to have multiple presenters um, and that will help because listening to a couple of different voices is always nice uh, rather than listening to one voice uh, the whole time. And also by having different presenters, you know, the, the, the uh, audience's attention is being moved around. You, can, you guys can also move around and use the space as you, uh, as you wish in order to kind of make it a more engaging experience for them. All right. Thank you. So um, in the interest of time, let's, let's summarize uh, quickly. Summarize um, or synthesize? A bit of both, let's say. <laughs> um, we've talked a lot about the structure um, of, of your document. Um, that's a really important uh, because that's the canvas that you will then have to perform in front of on the day. Um, but it's by far not the, the only element. So the journey that you're going to go on over the next couple of months or month uh, until the presentation um, you need to start thinking about what what is your message going to be for this for this pitch. What's how are we going to convey that message with a convincing story, and what's the what's the document going to be? How are we going to draft that document to 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 make it convincing and compelling? You'll then hopefully start to present it. Use the presentation to uh, solicit feedback. See what works. See what doesn't, and iterate. Finalize it. Agree on your roles practice your final pitch, uh, practice, practice, practice. We can't really um, uh, say that enough. And then hopefully at the end, nail it on the day um, and, and have a, have a, a fantastic uh, 10 minute presentation and, and good questions afterwards. One final thing. So um, if any of you are interested in um, McKinsey as your destination following graduation uh, or, or interested in exploring a career in consulting. We have some information and this will be sent to you um, in, in the pack that you'll receive after, after we close. We don't want to spend too much time on that now um, because we see that there's, um, there's a few minutes left uh, for questions and we'd love to see as many questions as possible from, from you guys. So use the, uh, the chat panel to, to send in a few. Right. Well, thanks very much, uh, guys. That that was really informative. I was yeah, scribbling away notes there. There's a few things that I'm I'm going to sort of try and apply yeah, when I'm in similar situations and yeah, might not be giving formal pitches, but but nonetheless, yeah, just generally conveying points at, at work. That's really useful. And I particularly like the idea of channeling a rock band when I'm making presentations. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give that give that a try. Um, That's the way to do this. <laughs> we, um, we we don't have that many questions uh, in in the chat at the moment. So please, uh, for those of you who are in the audience, please submit your your questions. But I think just to sort of start with, um, you've mentioned on a couple of occasions the importance about getting feedback uh, as you develop your your presentation. I was just wondering, based you're both in your experience of former student and, and in your you, then your subsequent professional careers. Um, do you have any tips on on who to approach for feedback uh, on your your presentation? Um, I mean, yes. the The obvious one would be um, you know academic staff 
that you've worked closely with that are supporting your your formula student effort um, they would be a they would be a good one to, to, to begin with also your peers um, and uh, presenting to them and getting their kind of unsolicited no, or um, unconstrained feedback on on what works and what doesn't um, I think the um, the important element for me is to try and have a mix of people who maybe are familiar with the content and can give you direct feedback on, on, on details and whether you're presenting them clearly, but also talking to people who have never seen your presentation before and getting their feedback on, did they understand what it was about? Was it clear? Um, you know, what, what was the impression that they got from it as a, as an, completely unfamiliar audience member did they follow the logical reasoning of the presentation and so forth christos any anything more to it to add no i, I totally agree uh, maybe one more point i think um of course you can do this and, and present and then collect feedback but maybe at the very end you can also be more specific and before you present you say hey i want to present to you can you give me feedback on the structure or can you give me feedback on this particular point so I mean, maybe it's not something you should do on the very beginning because you need to get more general feedback, but it's also good at the very end to guide your audience on ex what on where you need your feedback huh? so that they can be also more focused on, focus on this. Yeah. And I guess you don't have to be constrained to your university or your team. You know, you might potentially uh, have, have kind of people, maybe sponsors or that kind of thing who you could uh, tap up because they, they will appreciate what makes a good business pitch and particularly where they've got people asking them for money. Now that's, that's really helpful. Exactly. Uh, we've got a question here from um, Gavin in uh, the OBR autonomous team uh, where he's asked, is it effective to talk back and forth between presenters or will that alienate the audience? Um, so if we're talking about back and forth in terms of a discussion, I think that would, could be challenging. Um, because it, it it may be difficult to follow and it, it, you know it's not necessarily the place you're so time constrained that you really want to use that 10 minutes to effectively put across all of the arguments and messages that that, that you need to um, in terms of having multiple presenters and having people who specialize in a particular area deliver one page or two pages then, then that's fine. Um, you know, that's what we've aimed to do today between Christos and I. Um, as I said, it's nice to vary the delivery. Um, and so we've we've split this 30 minute presentation across the, the two of us as well. Um, hopefully that answers your question, but if not, then please feel free to, to put a follow up um, so that we understand it better. Uh, Christos, of course, if anything to add? Uh, no, I think you've covered it. Great. And we've had a, a question here from, from Abdul at, at uh, NUS, the National University of Science and, and Technology, uh, where he, he's asking, um, for the competition, uh, can anyone make their financials strong by assuming any number of sales, et cetera? So what is the criteria for, for judges to rate that which company is going to be profitable? I, I think just from a, a competition perspective, Abdul, you know, we, we provide a lot of um, freedom within the, the the rules to allow you to, to set your own scenario in which you're pitching your 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 business case. Um, but to a certain, you know, it does have to be credible. Um, so you know, you could potentially set out a scenario, a market gap, or that kind of thing, where it's easy for anyone to make a compelling pitch. Um, but I think that the, the judges would perhaps look um, uh, less favorably on that. They, they want it to be to be realistic. But I think, you know, guys, from your perspective, uh, you know, the financials are a key part of, of this element of the competition you know, within the time constraint. How do you think um, uh, how do you think you best get those across? I think. Um... The important thing there is to, to be clear on what assumptions you've made, um, because that is the foundation of, of any scenario planning. 
Um, and as Elliot already said, um, you know, those assumptions need to be credible and have a credible ring to them. So if you're assuming sales figures, you know, challenging uh, the, the VW Golf, um, people are going to immediately look at that and say, okay, you know, we just don't see this product um, as, as selling in, in those rates. Um, so um, I would say um, try and make um, try and make reasonable assumptions. Try and back them up with uh, with any sort of uh, market data or benchmarking that you can find, um, and and show um, show lo logical reasoning as to why uh, why you've structured those assumptions towards the conclusion that you're making about your your financial scenarios. Excellent. Um, I, I'm conscious that it's now four o'clock and, and we've kind of reached the end of the, of the, the time. Uh, just to, as a final question, um, uh, just maybe get, get your thoughts. Uh, I'm interested to sort of know who, from your personal perspectives, if you can come up with some examples of people who you think convey, convey their, their message uh, really well. I mean, the, the person who springs out in my mind is maybe some of the likes of Steve Jobs, uh, you know, when he was still alive. Uh, I'm not sort of uh, suggesting that everyone needs to turn up in, in polo neck shirt, uh, turtle neck shirts, etc. But yeah, he had a very clear message, very simple slides, but nonetheless got his message uh, across. And I just I wonder, putting you guys on the spot, whether there were any people who you, who you thought uh, could uh, the, our teams could role model? Um, I'm, I'm not going to name a, an individual, but I'm going to say that things that I've seen where, where the messaging has always been really good and really clear are, are TED Talks, for example. Um, so TED Talks are very time constrained. They can be anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes. Uh, and typically the concepts that they're trying to put across are quite or can be quite complex um, and depending on on this on the individual they have visual aids or they don't have visual aids they're just telling a story but if you if you listen to and analyze the way that you know a good TED talk is delivered typically it it really does follow that top-down messaging structure um, and people are able to weave really engaging stories um, uh, while maintaining that, that top-down structure. So they start with an intro. Today, I'm going to talk to you about this, and I'm going to hope that by telling you this, you will make such and such a change in your life, for example. And then they start going into their argumentation. They And I find them to be engaging and also easy to follow and memorable. And those really are the, the signs of a, of a good presentation. Excellent. Christos, is there anyone you'd highlight? I agree. I think on top I would just add, uh, I think, good journalism, because it's also in the similar direction, right? So you have a maybe an article where you, you can read the title and you basically understand what it's about. So they have a summary, synthesized very well the so what, and then you can go through that article and really get the, the, the important facts. And I think there are many of these that, um, mostly financial, financial articles, right? That have the title, then they have the three ex points for executive summary, and then they continue. So it's basically this, exactly this type of communication, top-down communication, uh, which you need, especially when you uh, when you just want to read through quickly an article. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Well, that, that brings us to the end of this uh, this seminar. Um, uh, yeah, really like to thank uh, Ivo and, and Christos for, for their time today, for that, that really uh, thought-breaking presentation. I hope that everyone who's online today will uh, reflect on on what we've covered today. Uh, try and incorporate that into uh, their presentation planning. Uh, we'll look forward to, to seeing some hopefully great uh, presentations um, next month. Um, and uh, you yeah, will follow up with, uh, with with the slide pack and some further resources. As I said, there's other resources online. Uh, you don't have to do a particularly uh, sophisticated Google search to find some really helpful material to, to sort of assist you. Um, so all that's left to say is, uh, is best of luck with the rest of your uh, preparations and we'll look forward to seeing you at Silverstone. Thank you all. Looking forward to seeing some of you in person, hopefully at the event. Thank you so much. Thank you.